My name is Christine Dalton. I'm the Historic Preservation Officer and Community Planner for the City of Sanford, for those of you who don't already know me. And we're very happy to have Citizens Academy here um, to hear Joe's uh, talk because it's really important and germane to our downtown. Um, I also wanted to make note that members of the Sanford Historic Trust have been invited and are in attendance. Um, they have the reveal of their images of Stanford calendar on Friday, so that will be at the Welcome Center and a couple of other locations. So um, please be sure to grab a copy because it's always really wonderful. And uh, introducing Joe, Joe is the principal of a company called Urban Three, and they're a consulting company that was created out of a real estate developer public interest projects, and this is in Asheville, North Carolina. Um, prior to creating Urban 3, he served as the executive director for the Asheville Downtown Association. Joe is also um, a city planner and previously worked for the city of West Palm Beach. And I could go on and on about um, Joe's um, accolades because there are many, but I'm not going to take up too much time with that. I'm going to have Joe come up and you can hear his message for yourself. So with that, I will introduce Joe. Thanks, Joe. Uh, thanks for having me here. Thanks for having me in this great facility in this cute little downtown. It's really quite, I was really quite blown away seeing the streets and your architecture here. Um, it's actually quite rare to find in Florida an authentic little place, a, a little old downtown. This is it's, it's something you should appreciate, the great uh, oak trees that you have and the wonderful architecture. Um, I'm from Asheville, North Carolina. Who's been to Asheville? Oh, wow. So I, I did a talk in... Um, in Alabama, where I saw Christine, and I, I challenged the audience about taxation. Um, this is, I'll challenge you all about this. We are a country that is formed on a tax revolt, right? The Tea Party. So, show of hands, who in this room has read your local tax policies for your real estate assessment? But really, this is what drives your city. This is what really was, what makes this place work and tick. And you have to understand how that works. Um, I'm from Asheville, North Carolina. It's up in the western mountains of, um, of North Carolina. Beautiful setting, Smoky Mountains. In the 1920s, like a lot of, lot of, lot of Florida cities, we were exploding. We were growing at 20% um, of population growth every single year that decade. This building was built in 1927. Um, in that process of growth, we achieved the highest debt per capita of the United, entire United States. We were number one in debt. When the Depression hit and the, our books were audited, we thought we had $5 million in the bank. It turned out we had $18,000 in the bank. Our entire city council was indicted and the mayor committed suicide. That's how we entered the Depression. Um, we chose to, to pay off our obligated bonds um, from the 1920s. So it took us until seven, 1976. This is, here, here's the paper, 1976. Here we are burning the last bond. But when we did pay off that debt, we tried to catch up to other cities. So what we did is we cut a highway through the north side of downtown, which became the Crosstown Expressway, and the coup de grace was when we blew up Bowcatcher Mountain. This is, this is, we call this Bowcatcher Cut. On the other side of the cut, the mall happened and our downtown died. Is this a familiar story? You know, these are shots of Asheville from not too long ago. That's a 1996 Chevy Celebrity right there. just boarded up buildings and we just walked away from them. And like a Greek choir, anytime somebody tried to fix a building downtown or do something urban, those children's children would rise up and say, that's not who we are. We're not, we're not Boston, we're not, we're not Savannah, we're not New Orleans, that's not who we are, we're not urban, we're, we're a rural mountain town. Um, there are people that did try, the city did take some leadership, it started doing some infrastructure projects. Julian Price inherited um, a, a great deal of money, moved to Asheville, he's originally from Greensboro, and he basically put his money to work, created a for-profit real estate development company called Public Interest Projects. 75% of the money goes into sticks and bricks, fixing buildings, and we reserve 25% to seed businesses. So we find people in the community that have tremendous ideas because we want stuff active on the street. But really, I come from Rome, New York. I don't know if y'all ever heard of Rome, New York. It's up, up here in the middle of the state. And Rome was the center of the Erie Canal. The Erie Canal went east and west from Rome. It was started in Rome. This is what Rome used to look like. This is my hometown. And uh, somebody came up with the brilliant idea of reproducing the Revolutionary War fort that used to be in my hometown. We had this really inconvenient thing where our downtown was built on top of the fort. So they actually used federal dollars to tear all of this stuff down when I was a kid. We got this. This is my downtown. We get these uh, Italians that dress up like revolutionaries and uh, run around in the field. They, they expanded the boundary 
into this area, did an urban renewal area, did a pedestrian mall because, hey, it's the 1970s, you need a pedestrian mall, right? Put a plaza on the pedestrian mall because I guess 12 acres of open space wasn't enough, so uh, why not more? A couple parking garages, because y'all are going to drive up to Rome and come visit a wooden fort, right? Um, a new city hall, and because that parking garage was way too far away, that's like 100 feet, they built a surface lot right next to city hall, a mall across the highway, and this crazy thing, it's like Le Corbusier meets the Ponte Vecchio, this big modernist concrete thing that shot out over the highway and dumped into the mall, and it had stores inside it. It was, it was like three times the width of this room. They gave out checks to 230 merchants to relocate in this project area. Of the 230 checks that were distributed, 18 businesses relocated here. I was like, well, you know, I can go to school in Miami and there's beaches down there, maybe I'll do that. And while I was there in the School of Architecture, um, I met these two. This is Liz Plater Zyberk and Andrea Stuani, and at the time they were formulating ideas of new urbanism. But really what they were doing is they were saying, hey Joe, um, we're dealing with this kind of stuff, you know, or this, this kind of inhospitable kind of environments for people that were just neglecting and just building places for cars. In a way, we used to joke about it. We'd call it a cartoon of the human environment. But the sad reality is it's a real place called San Antonio. While I was in architecture school, I went to another Rome. I went to Rome, Italy and spent a semester there. And while I was there, I, ate, I lived there, I, I went to school there, and I ate right here. And it really got me thinking. I'm like, why don't we think of cities as places in time? They, they have a trajectory, right? This Rome has been around for thousands of years. My Rome made it like 200 years before it assassinated itself. What's up with that? Is cities are places in time and they're no different than you all. They're just collections of people. So if you want to see how I started my life, this is me when I was three months old, when I had hair. And this is my trajectory, to be Papa. Or more importantly, I look at this guy. This is my dad, again, when I had hair. And I've got two genetic issues in my family. I'm genetically Italian. And I also have a genetic predisposition to heart disease. Every Minicozy male in my family has had a heart issue. My dad has had a seven bypass heart surgery. Now I can sit there and take this information and go, hey, I'm gonna eat some more pizza, I love pizza. I'm gonna stop exercising. Of course I wouldn't do that. I've got data now, right? I know that I have to take corrective action. So here's a challenge to you all, the citizens of, of, of Sanford. What heart attacks are you avoiding that other places have had? How can you learn from Orlando? You know, just be aware of that and psychically find a, a, an image of where you want to go in your future. And be conscious to the fact that you have to adapt to things. There are things that you want. You may want a wider street or more parking. But what does that cost? You know, so just be aware of this stuff. So back to public interest projects. Um, this is what we were doing before and after. And just, you know, we brought in housing. Housing is what makes downtowns thrive. This isn't to say you all should live downtown, it's to afford, just to say, let's just afford the opportunity for other people to do it. You need to make your downtown. If you look at the trajectory of histories over time, 10,000 years of human development, we've made cities with people living downtown. We've also had suburbs in all of those too. They've just gotten bigger when we got a car. Um, so our message as a developer is you have to measure stuff, you need data um, to manage it. So my city, is essentially a really big real estate development project called the city of Asheville. And it's got a finite boundary of land to work with. You can't make another Asheville. My state has made my boundaries fixed. I can't, we can't annex any more land. My county can't annex the next county over. So those two split vehicles are fixed assets of real estate, right? If we look up the word incorporate in Oxford Dictionary, it says to constitute a company, a city, or other organization as a legal corporation. So there's very little difference between our $15 million real estate development company and my city is a chartered corporation. It is chartered by the state. There is a, there is a corporate charter for my, my county and my city. The same with y'all. So my mayor is the CEO of a very large real estate development company. My city is worth $12.8 billion of taxable value. Does my mayor see herself as six times the value of Ted Turner? She should. That's the value of our corporation. What's your city worth? We like to talk to folks about looking at the city like the way a farmer looks at crops. The farmer's looking at the farm and saying, how much acres do I have? What's my crop yield per acre, my fertilizer per acre, my water per acre, and what does it yield in the marketplace, and can I make this work economically? They don't just go out and just till all the soil, right? So here's one of our buildings. 
We rehabbed it and made uh, retail, office, and residential. Uh, the city built this sidewalk right here, and, uh, and some folks said this is a gift to us, that you gave that developer money. You built that developer sidewalk. Okay, true. We didn't pay for that. Thank you, city, for the garbage can, the bike rack, two benches, and a street tree. That's awesome. Thank you. We didn't pay for it. $30,000 worth of work. But hey, we took this from $300,000 of taxable value to $11 million of taxable value. So the taxes paid on that property just shot up 3,500%, right? That's community taxes y'all get. Go out and buy more 3,000% more garbage cans. We don't care. This is how you cultivate community wealth. And people are like, well, Joe, that's fine, but that's just an $11 million building. We've got this Walmart over here at $20 million. That Walmart pays $200,000 in taxes. This is my house. We're on a tenth of an acre. If you had a one-acre cookie cutter that fell from space and hit my neighborhood, it's going to grab 10 houses, right? Each of us paying 2,000 bucks a house or about $20,000 an acre in taxes. You take that acre, fly it in space, drop it on that Walmart, divide Walmart by the 34 acres of my corporation that is consumed, this is what it's paying per acre. If you had an acre of our building, this is what you get. So if you're a counselor or a mayor, what kind of cash flow would you want to have? This is cute and everything, but we take the Walmart for the retail taxes, not the property taxes. So let's remove me and let's run the numbers. Again, we get distracted by the wrong number. We look at this, which is an aggregate number, and not see the, how it functions as, as, a, as a apples to apples. The city only gets a portion of a portion of that. So eight cents on the sales on the dollar, 27% of that, which equals 47,500. Add that to the property taxes, and this is the total tax take per acre. Retail plus property taxes. This is just our property taxes. You add our retail taxes, now you're cooking with gas because we sell stuff too. And when you put them side by side, you can see what kind of data is there to make a more competent decision. Hell, oh, this is jobs. Here's, here's uh, residential per acre. We've got 90 versus zero. You know, we, we, we fail to acknowledge the fact that we've built this stuff for tens of thousands of years. That's not a bad building. You know, it's been with us from, since 1925. It started at J.C. Penney's department store. So some people say to me, like, dude, what's your problem, man? Why do you hate Walmart? And they totally missed the point. Um, I was presenting at the International Association of Tax Assessing Officers Conference, but this guy presented at 8 in the morning. And he's up there, he's doing his PowerPoint, and he's showing spreadsheets on how cheap his buildings are. And the assessors are agnostic people. If it's cheap, it's cheap. That's the way they operate. They can't make value. Now, I'm sitting there watching this, drinking my coffee in the back of the room, and I'm like, damn, this is brilliant. He's getting all of his property tax bills lowered. There's 2,000 assessors in the room in one meeting. Now, the citizen inside me, that's all I could hear him say is, I'm going to pay the lowest taxes possible in your community. So I went up to the microphone after his presentation. I asked him, I said, Mr. Terrell, what's the useful life of one of your buildings? He's like, 15 years. We'll be out of that building in 15 years. We designed that building to depreciate as fast as possible, then we build another one in order to depreciate that. We get revenue off the depreciation, and what we're really interested in is the distribution network, so the building doesn't really matter. That's it. Don't hate the player, hate the game. What's awesome about Walmart is they're very, very smart people, and they are showing you how they're exploiting your policies. But they're your policies. This is your community. If you think it's cool to have a 15-year useful life on a building, awesome. Just be aware of that. I like to eat pizza. I don't eat it every single week. I can't. Once a month, I'll do it. I have to, I have to go with that, that knowledge of that data. This is the mall. Why somebody would do a mall versus residential. Commercial property is worth more than residential property. That's the backbone of most taxation in, in most cities. But let's not stop there. Here's downtown. So here's the mall at $8,000 an acre. Here's our building and what it pays in county taxes per acre versus the mall to the county. So what you see is what's good for the downtown is great for the city, but it's incredible for the county. More begets more. I, I'm doing fifth grade math to show you productivity, right? It's just dividing the acres into the value. We do this, right? We, when we compare cars, could y'all remember, imagine if we're like having a coffee and I'm telling you about my, my truck and what it gets in miles per tank. And, and it's, it's the most, most cool vehicle on this page because it gets 650 miles per tank. Y'all would laugh at me. You're like, Joe, come on, that's silly. All tanks are different sizes. It's that gallon of gasoline that propels the vehicle. That's how we rank them. It's the miles per gallon. The numbers change when you say miles per gallon. And we should all be driving BMW Assettas at 70 miles per gallon. 
We've done this all across the country, Canada, New Zealand. It doesn't matter where you go. For every dollar of taxes somebody's paying out to the county, somebody in the city's paying about, on average, about 550 per that dollar to that county. Here's the Walmart, here's the mall. This is a two-story building. That could be in Driggs, Idaho, which is 2,000 people in the land area of Palm Beach County. Or it could be a three-story building, uh, Durham, uh, San Francisco. It doesn't matter where you go. You see the same trend. And it's not a proportional growth. It's an exponential growth as you stack stories. This is a six-story building right here. So it's not even taught getting into high-rise code at that point. This is all below high-rise. So this may be so start to sound like a simple concept to you. Some people come up to me like, Joe, this is way too simple. How is it that people... This hasn't sunk in with people. I've been talking about this since 2009. And I, and I tell people, like, sometimes paradigm shifts take a while to kind of figure out. Do you all remember um, the 70s? Some of you all remember the 70s? Um, in 1972, a pilot put wheels on luggage and took out a patent. In 1991, the patent expired, and now we all got wheels on luggage. Some of you all may remember a time of not having wheels on luggage. If it took us 15 years to put wheels on luggage once somebody discovered them, but more importantly, we actually put a man on the moon before he put wheels on luggage. And sometimes simple things take a while to figure out. I'm gonna show you what's going on inside your city. We can take the city and move the city aside, and I can map your streets and infrastructure, the buildings that are built on those, and your ologies, your hydrology, your geology. You all already do this stuff. The only magic of what we do is we split nature and the man-made and we show you your economics as a model. So to go back and reflect upon Asheville, this is how our politicians and our community typically looks at Asheville. This is a uh, gray is non-taxable, so this is a big park right here, so it doesn't pay any taxes. So just to be cold about it, it's like doesn't pay taxes, I don't care about it. Then we've got low value to hot is high value. And you see here, this, is, this property right here, this is, this is the Biltmore Estate. It's worth $100 million. Um, when Bill Cecil shows up at one of our council meetings, his house is worth $100 million. When he shows up at one of our council meetings, we all genuflect and, and thank him for his time to grace us with his presence, right? The guy with the $100 million house. But it's not fair. His property is 4,000 acres. He's got the biggest house in America. So he's got the biggest gas tank. So rather than total value, let's do value per acre and the map changes. I'll just show it to you in 3D. Does anybody want to take a wild guess where downtown Asheville is? Boom, right there. And we can see the Biltmore Estate here. So when you lay your taxes on this model, everybody's paying the same millage rate, right? Everybody's paying the same thickness of taxes, and if you throw a blanket of the same thickness on this model, where does it pop up? Right in the center there. This is my entire county, and if this is mama bear, this is baby bear. That's, that's Black Mountain, that's 10 miles away, and you can see its main street functioning the same way as this model. And again, both those models of urban design are models that we've had for generations and eons. That little main street, the little downtown, the mixed use environment, all of that stuff. Uh, we did West Palm Beach. You can see they hug the coast, and their value here is downtown West Palm Beach. Um, this is kind of interesting. Just if you just had 1.2 acres of this building, it would equal the 19-acre Walmart. Oh, incidentally, we had a lot of fun with Donald Trump. Um, we grabbed all his properties, and this is what he's pulling per acre. So the Donald's worth about 400,000 400, an acre in Palm Beach County, um, which is actually less than, less taxably productive than one of the poorest neighborhoods in downtown West Palm Beach. This is the Northwest neighborhood. Three of these shotgun shacks are, are, are condemned. You can see the police boarded up sign on all three of those. They're paying more taxes than Donald Trump. That's the reality of that productivity. So I was just, uh, this morning, I just, I just came here from Traverse City, um, Michigan. And there's a lot of parallels in your physical environment and your size and your opportunity that y'all should look at Traverse City. Um, this is the value that they get. That's a lake right there. That's one of the Great Lakes. But this is what happens with the rehab downtown up against that lake. This little building right here is just a little building glued onto the front of a parking garage. 0.7 acres of that building at $12 million an acre would equal the 21-acre uh, big department store. If you cut this building in half, it would equal the 13-acre Kohl's. 
department store area. And what's kind of wild is if you, just had, if you just had six acres of that building, it would equal all 507 acres of houses built between 1950 and 2000. So could you make six acres happen somewhere? And they, they literally have about 12 acres of surface parking lots. They could easily do this. So to show you how, what, what this means, in Chattanooga we did this project. This is downtown. This is, the, this is their hipster area over here. This is, where all, this is like Brooklyn. This is where like men with beards down to their knees ride bikes across this. They've got stuff stapled in their face. They're very hip. Um, over there, this developer from Atlanta wanted to do this Publix grocery store and was asking to get rid of all the urban design guidelines because they had this developer from Atlanta that wanted to do a conventional box grocery store. So you've got your surface parking lot and you've got your, bo your box. There's the site. In the neighborhood, they already had stuff doing mixed-use development. This is on Main Street here, or the secondary street. This is um, a local guy did this urban grocer here. And then you have townhouses. So you have the ingredients of the urban environment already around that neighborhood. This is a conventional Publix. You all know what these look like, right? Surface parking lot box. They already had them there. This is office above retail, residential above retail just down the street, so they're already getting that too. This is um, the Green Life Grocery, which is just down the street, a local guy did this. So it's, this is called a deep throat model where you have a box and then you put a liner building on the front of it that, that looks like an urban building, it's two stories. So these are all like yoga studios and like, I don't know, dog beauty salons or whatever, but that's like a Whole Foods kind of thing right there. Um, Publix has done some crazy stuff before. This is a Publix built in 1998 in Miami Beach. It looks like a UFO hit it, but um, it's really a conveyor belt to get you to the roof because there's parking on the roof, two layers of parking. Um, this is a small footprint Publix in West Palm Beach, Florida, and, and there it is there. So it's got a pedestrian front, and it's also got your conventional parking front. So Publix has done other things as well. So let's just see if they could do a different thing on this site. So here's the site. There's 34 foot of grade change. One of the things that was kind of mind blowing to me, you saw the drawing. Did you all see that there was a retaining wall going through the whole site? Let's go back to that for a second. This is a retaining wall. I sit on, a, I sit on my community's planning board. What blows my mind is how few people can actually read drawings and they don't understand the full effect of what's going to happen. And I'm just letting you know that you can be taken advantage of in that situation because the developer clearly labels it in five point font right there. But I saw that, I was like, there's a retaining wall. So what we did is we made it easy. We made a Google SketchUp model and showed them. I mean, it's not a good model. It's just we just hacked something together. All of these houses now get to look at a tarmac of a roof, and here's your quarter mile long future graffiti wall, right? But what we're doing is we're running the taxes. So that's one option. So yes, Mayor, you're right. This is an option on the table. But what are the other options? When we develop stuff, we're always looking at opportunity costs. What are all the opportunities that we have and how does it cost us stuff? So let's just do the same thing as a city. Here's if you just did townhouses, facing housing, put a couple of mixed use buildings in the corner, you still have your surface parking lot in your Publix. That meets the code. Here's what it looks like. If you do a better site design, do what the local guy did with the Green Life building. Here's your grocery store, ring the site. This is what it looks like. Uh, use the grade of the hill and just drive on the roof. You don't even have to build the ramp. Just do what uh, Miami Beach did. Densify the heck out of the site. Do a lot of buildings. This is what you get. Um, back it down to West Palm Beach. Small footprint. Mix of uses around the site. Big parking in the center. This is what you get. And let's say you irritate the developer. He goes back to Atlanta with his Publix. You don't get that. You just get what's already happening in the neighborhood. Mixed use buildings and townhouses. Or mixed use buildings and townhouses. Okay, I went fairly fast through this because I wanted to show you the taxes. This is the taxes currently paid on the site, and this is what the developer's proposing to pay. So the mayor is indeed right when he says this is getting three times the taxes, right? Y'all follow me there? Now, if you just had option number one, this is what you could get in taxes. If you do a better site design, this is what you could get in taxes. If you go crazy and do Miami Beach, you're going to get crazy taxes. Back it down to West Palm Beach in your no-build scenario. So the community really needs to have a conversation. What's in it for us to give away our policies, to give away our desires and our opportunities for you to do your project? I understand it's difficult for you to do mixed-use development. There's some brain damage there. But we need to know what the trade-off is, right? So just taking two of these, what they're proposing, and let's take the Green Life model here. Here's the difference. Here's the difference in taxes. 
right, on an annual basis. Really, that's not the right way to look at it. And when you get this built, you are stuck with it for 20 years, 30 years, in this case for a grocery store, at least for 20 years for a Walmart. So if you multiply these numbers times 20 years, I'll keep it, keep it conservative, 20 years, these are, the numbers, these are the numbers you're talking about. You're taking a $600,000 gain over 20 years, you're foregoing millions. You all could sit at the council meeting and go, you know what? We understand it's difficult for you to do a mixed-use development. We're going to reach in our pocket and just hand you $2 million out of our general fund. Just, to, just, to, just for, your, for your education and, and heartbreak to get other people involved. If they did that, they'd be ahead of the game after 20 years by 2.2 million bucks versus what's being offered. Does that make sense? Y'all get this? Is this too nerdy? It's seven o'clock at night. You know, this as citizens, you are engaged in this stuff. You should be engaged in this stuff, and you have to think of your money and how you can afford the things that you want. Um, realize your tax code wasn't delivered by Moses. You know, we can change some of this stuff, and it's not invisible market forces that are driving the market. The market will show you where the loopholes are, and that is indeed a subsidy. It's just an unconscious subsidy. Put real simply, if you tax me on value. There's a perverse incentive for me to build junk in your community, period. You're not charging me for the pipe. So all this is public policy. Taxes drive everything. In Normandy, you used to be taxed on your building footprint, and then people started projecting out over the street to get extra square footage without being taxed for it. They changed the tax code. In England, you were taxed progressively. The more windows you had, the more shillings you paid, so people boarded up their windows to avoid taxes. In France, you were taxed below your roof line. Anything below your roof line was building. Anything above the roof line was your roof. People stole Francois Mansart's roof typology, which is a Mansart roof, and stuck stories up in it. And they're like, yeah, that's, a, that's, that's clearly the roof, right? It's a tax loophole. So figure out what policies can hurt you and put the gun down. You know, Look at the data of what you are and do the math on it. This was an old big box of its day but it's recycled. You can still have this stuff, but do it in a form that gives you wealth in the future. Realize your downtown, your downtown is your golden goose. This will produce wealth for you into the future. You've got to grow it up. For a city your size, like uh, Traverse City that I showed you with that five-story mixed-use building at $50 million an acre, they're 15,000 people. They're like, what, one-seventh the size of you guys? One-fifth the size of you? Probably one-fifth or one-fourth. And they're ahead of you that way. So learn from those other places. Find other, other grandparents that have been down that road. Um, you've got this heritage and this history. Keep on building on it. Uh, this is a wonderful community with, with an incredible, authentic downtown, which is incredibly rare in this state. And do your math. Thanks.